Thank you, worship band. Thank you, all of you who are worshiping with us today, those who are joining online. Today we have a guest speaker. I'm excited to get to introduce him. His name is Brent Marion. He and his wife, Mary, have been helping people learn to follow Jesus in Jordan for about seven years now. There are some of our missionaries, and we're excited to hear about their work and also from God's word from him. Would you welcome him this morning? Good morning, everybody. Um, as he said, my name's Brent. My wife, Mary, is sitting back here. And our two kids, Claire and Eleanor, are in the kids' service. Um, I'm sure they're enjoying it. Uh, but as he said, we've been in, in Jordan for seven years. It took us a long time to learn Arabic, but we do speak Arabic, and all the ministry we do now is in Arabic. Um, and this morning, I'm going to take our time and split it into two different things. First, I want to, to share a little bit from God's word or share a little bit about God and then share some stories of what God is doing in Jordan um, or in the Middle East. This one's recorded or streamed, whatever. Anyhow, we're in the Middle East. Um, so let's start by talking about God a little bit. Let's hit the first slide. There, you're up there. Um, so I like to ask the question, who is God? And these first few minutes, I want to share some of the theological issues that we have to deal with when working with Muslims. And this is a big one. Who is God? Who is our God? Um, let's hit the next one. And what we like to do is talk about God's attributes. Talk about God's attributes, who he is, what makes God, God. So we have a few verses here that kind of talk about how great God is. Um, because there is, there is a mystery to, to how great he is. He's knowable. We can know our God. He wants us to know him. But he's also greater than we can even imagine. Um, Psalm 150, 40, 145 says, Great is the Lord and most worthy of all praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Psalm 150, praise him for his acts of power Praise him for his surpassing greatness. And in Isaiah 55, we see how, how as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways, God's ways, higher than our ways. And his thoughts, God's thoughts, are higher than our thoughts. So I don't approach this this morning saying, I know everything. I can understand. No, but we can understand many things about God. Um, and one of the things we can understand is about his mercy and his justice. Hit the next slide. They disappeared. There we go. Um, all right, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, ignore the flying pig. Um, <laughs> but when we talk about this with Muslims, we have to differentiate between who God is and who they think he is. Because when we talk about God, um, one way we can do this is talk about how he is a maximally great being. In other words, he is the greatest thing we can think of. So if I can um, think of, of something that is greater, well, then whatever I was initially thinking of was not the fullness of who God is. Um, and, oh yeah, there we are. Okay. Okay. So we talk about this maximally great being. To me, maximally great, God must be all-knowing. He must be all-powerful. He must be morally perfect. And so God being this maximally great being, did we skip a slide? I'm not sure. There we go. Okay. I'm moving my hand, so maybe you thought I was pointing. I don't know. So let me back up just a second. God being, being one creator God. So Muslims and Christians agree with this, they agree that God exists. They believe God is the creator of everything. There are many things that we agree with, but there are also many things we disagree with or understand differently about who God is. Muslims question why Christians hold the theology that we hold. So in our work, we must be able to, to answer these questions well with biblically sound answers. Now we can move on. So we, I started talking about how God is this maximally great being. He's greater than anything we can imagine. But if we can imagine something greater, 
then, then whatever we were initially thinking of cannot be God. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this. I'm not going to bore you to death. But some of the questions we get from our Muslim friends are, why do you believe Jesus is God? Why do Christians teach that Jesus died on the cross? Why do Christians not believe that God can forgive as he pleases? Now, we do believe God can forgive. But Muslims believe that God can just forgive as he wants. Um, and we'll see a difference there in a second. And um, say, wasn't Jesus only a prophet? You say, why do, why do Christians worship three gods? Spoiler, we don't. Um, let's look at the next one. All right. So I started saying this. God is both merciful and just. And when we as Christians talk about this, what we're saying is God is the most merciful. There is nothing in existence that is more merciful than God, right? That's in the Bible. I'm not making this stuff up. Um, so for God to be a maximally great being, to be God, God must be the most merciful being in existence, but he also must be the most just being in existence. And so if we talk about being the most merciful or the most forgiving, what we're trying to say is that God is able to forgive each and every sin ever committed. So if I, I could imagine somebody, who can I pick on? Larry's not here. I'll just use my wife, Mary. So say, say I took our car and I, I ran into a tree, dented the bumper a little bit. She could forgive me for that, hopefully. Um, but imagine I'm, I'm just playing around on the interstate and, and I end up just total in the car completely. Now she's just mad. She's angry at me. She's like, I'm never going to forgive you for that. Well, I can imagine a wife that's more forgiving. I can imagine a wife that would forgive me for totaling the car. That's a silly little, exa little example to get this idea across that if we can imagine a God that only forgives some sin, well, then what we're thinking of isn't God. God, to be the most merciful and the most forgiving, is able to forgive each and every sin. The same argument when we talk about God being the most just. A just judge is going to punish every wrongdoing. Every single sin must be punished appropriately. A just judge isn't just going to throw out punishment for the fun of it, but if a wrong is done, it will be punished to be a just judge. So again, Let's do a silly example. So, okay, I lied. I, I, lied, to, I lied to Mary. This is just an example. <laughs> so say I lied to my wife, um, and she's like, oh, it's just a little white lie. It's okay. Well, say I, I'm trying to think of something mean, but I don't want to do it to my wife. So who else can I, I'll pick on this guy. I push you down a set of stairs. <laughs> and then you're like, okay, you're going to jail for a year, whatever it is, whatever the punishment is. Again, silly example, but you can see how in one, there was no justice. It was just like, oh, whatever. And in the second one, there was justice. What well, if there was a being like this, it's like, oh, you'll be punished, you'll be punished, you won't be punished. You that's not the most just being. That's not a just judge, right? To be the most just, just, our God must punish every sin appropriately. Let's look at the next one. So the question is, how can God be both? How can God forgive each and every sin, but also hold each and every sin accountable and punish each and every sin? So we understand that this is done through Jesus. Not just because he is the most just God and the most merciful God, but because he is the most loving being in existence. He, he forgives perfectly. He, he pours out justice perfectly. And he loves us, me and you, perfectly. So God paid the price himself. God took on that punishment for the sins that we commit through Jesus as he was punished for our sin on the cross. And only a being that did not deserve punishment could take on 
that punishment himself. Only God could take the punishment we deserve away from us so that he could also forgive us perfectly. So my sin has been punished through Jesus on the cross, and God forgives me through Jesus on the cross. In Islam, that's not how they understand God. In Islam, God can just forgive willy-nilly. He can choose, oh, you're forgiven, you're forgiven, you're not forgiven, you're... I'm being a little bit facetious, but that's the idea that comes across in Islamic theology. It's this idea that you cannot know for sure that you are forgiven. You cannot know for sure that you have salvation. Now, most Muslims agree that they will be punished for their sin, and they believe that God can forgive as he wills, but they don't believe that he is going to forgive each and every sin of those that follow him. So in in that sense, the God that Muslims know is not the most merciful God. He is not the most merciful being. He is not this maximally great being. He is not God. Let's look at the next one. Yeah, mercy, justice, and love. I already kind of talked on this, so I won't dwell on it more. But the fact is that Jesus willingly died because he perfectly loves us. Go on to the next one. Yeah, so I'm not getting deep into apologetics here. Um, I do enjoy apologetics, um, but it's not apologetics. It's not these philosophical arguments that are leading Muslims to Christ. Now, it's true. When, when we are asked these questions, we need to be able to, to defend our faith. But the focus is on God's love, not on these arguments. We're not trying to argue people into the faith. Sometimes that's what's needed, but not for the majority of Muslims that we work with. What is bringing people to faith is God's love. It's experiencing God. It is understanding who Jesus is and what Jesus did. There does need to be some intellectual understanding of what Jesus did for us. Um, And there is some logic involved with that. But those are secondary to understanding and experiencing God himself. The next one. So just a couple of verses here to kind of get this idea across. Um, but that the question is, why am I here? Why am I here in the church today? Why, why are we in, in the Middle East doing what we're doing? Um, and it's because Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And also, if you look at Romans 10, 14, and 15, we see the need for preaching and evangelism. How? How are people ever going to know who Jesus is? How are they going to know the only way to God unless somebody tells them? And, okay, I'll say this first. Um, So why am I here? To express the dire need for all people to call on the name of the Lord to be saved. And this isn't just something I'm saying is happening in Jordan. I'm not just saying this is something that needs to happen more where we are serving. What I want you to recognize this morning is that God is active. And in just a moment, I'm going to share some stories about how God is active and what he's doing uh, where we are in the Middle East. But I like to emphasize that God is just as active here as he is there. In, in um, Kingston, Tennessee, in Knoxville, Tennessee, in Alabama, in New York, in China, in Jordan, in Vietnam, God is active in this world. And what we try to do is come alongside the work of the Holy Spirit to see God's purposes fulfilled. Now, yes, God uses us. He uses the the ways we're gifted. He uses um, the fact that I have a family to to get us into certain homes. Um, He uses our personality, our abilities, our spiritual gifts. But he is using us, and he wants to use us, his people, you and me, to fulfill his purposes. Let's look at the next one. So, yeah, this is kind of what I said, but God uses us. 
And us is not just me and my wife. Us is us, the body of believers, God's people. He is using us to fulfill his purposes. Um, so I just wanted to get a picture of my kids up there. So that's my kids. So we'll hit the next one. Um, so I'm going to get into some of these stories. Um, I kind of fast forward over that pig flying thing. And so if that confused you, I'll just say real quick. The idea is that when we're thinking about this maximally great being, there, there are what some philosophers call possible worlds. And I don't want to get into all this. But it's basically if you can imagine something, that's po- a possible world. But there are things that are impossible, like a, a married bachelor or a square circle. And so it's this idea that as we think about God being maximally great, this concept is a coherent thought. So that's what that slide was getting towards, is the fact that if you can imagine a God that is the most merciful, the most just, the most loving, you have to ask, is that a coherent idea or not? And it is. It is coherent to believe that a God exists. Um. So, let's look at some of these stories. Sorry, I pointed out I shouldn't have. I got ahead of myself. Um, So, now these stories I'm about to share, if we could go back to the slide, are things that we are seeing God do in Jordan. Now, I'm, I'm able to share these stories because it's what I get to see with my own eyes, how God is working. There are things happening here that I don't get to see, that you get to see. And there's stories you could share with me. So again, I'm not trying to say, oh, look at what Brent did. I'm saying, look at what God is doing. Um, And so I like to share this story about a family um, starting to become a group of believers. Um, Now, not everybody in this family is is a baptized believer. So let me back up just a a little bit and share the beginning of their story. This will also give you a a small overview of our ministry um, in Jordan. So... We partner with a local church, and our main focus is reaching out to the Syrian Arabs in our community. So one way we do this is that we invite the Syrians to come to the church for what we call a registration. And we're just inviting the Syrians to come to the church, and we do a small interview, take some basic information, oh, what... Where are you from in Syria? What year did you come to Jordan? Um, What year did you come to our city? Um, How many people in your family? How many people are working? This type of stuff. At the end of that, we ask, uh, or we tell them we have two separate programs. And we let them choose if they want to be a part of one or both of these programs or neither. Um, And so program A, and we make this very clear to the people we're sharing with. Um, is that program A is, is more aid-focused. Um, sometimes there's food packages. Sometimes there's clothing drives. Sometimes we do trainings for people. And, and these are all at the church that, that we partner with, the church that sends us into the community. And we say, if you want to know when there's one of these weekend projects, we can let you know. You can come to the church and get some clothes or get some food or fill in the blank, X, Y, Z. And we're like, do you want to know when there's something like this? Everyone's like, oh, yeah, sure. They're like, okay, that's the first one. The second program is that if you would like, somebody from the church can come visit you in your home. They can sit with you, um, drink coffee, drink tea, sit down, talk about life, talk about work. But because we're coming from the church, we also like to share stories about the prophets according to the Bible. Um, And so we're asking these Syrian Arabs if they would like somebody from the church to visit them in their home hang out, and share Bible stories. And at this point, we've registered close to 500 families, and we've had like four that have said no. So what we've ended up with is lists of hundreds of people, hundreds of Syrian Arab Muslims that are telling us, yes, I want somebody to come share Bible stories with me in my home. Now, not everybody actually does want us to. Some are still hoping, oh, well, Maybe they'll give me extra aid. Maybe they'll, they'll pay my rent if they come in my house. Maybe they're just lonely and want somebody to hang out with and don't, don't really want to hear the Bible stories, but they're willing to let us come in because they just want somebody in their house. Um, hospitality is very big in Jordan, so it's a, a very common thing for people to visit like this. So 
over the last few years, we've actually had the opportunity to share with thousands of people. So hundreds of families, but in each family, I mean, there's at least four or five people, sometimes up to 10 or 15, um, that we could share with at a time. And this family is one of them. And when we interviewed her, not her, her mother, actually, this girl that you see with the baby was 12 years old when we started visiting her family. So her mother came and did this registration, and we actually asked her mother if she had ever had a dream of Jesus. And she got real quiet. Um, She had, like, the full niqab on, like, the the veil and everything. Um, And she's just like, are are you guys Christians? Like, talking to me and my friend. We're, we're like, with the church. We're like, yes, we're Christians. I'm a Christian. He's a Christian. Um, And she just starts laughing. She ends up taking her head covering off. Uh, and just start sharing about these four different dreams she she had had about Jesus at that point. Since then, she's had three more. And so when I talk about God being active, this is one of those ways that we see him active in the Middle East. Um, It's not something I ever thought I'd deal with growing up here, um, going to Bible college here in Tennessee. But I'm seeing God work in these ways. And so anyhow, that opened the door for us to go in and start sharing with the family. And she wanted to know, because what she told us is like, I've had these dreams, but she didn't have anybody to explain them to her. She didn't have any believers in Jesus to actually tell her what these dreams meant or who Jesus is. She's like, I saw him. He, he, he held his arms out and like welcomed me, but she didn't know what that meant. And so God is active but he wants and is waiting to use us to come alongside the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, People are rarely coming to faith just through dreams. That is preparing people to hear the fullness of the gospel that God has given to me and you to take to people. So, man, I could share, I could just talk about each of these stories all day. So, her mother, the one I'm talking about, it took five years from the day we met her um, until she made a statement of faith and became a baptized believer. And I think I shared a little bit about her story last time we were here a couple years ago. Um, And just amazing story. I could talk about her all day. Now, she's still a work in progress, as we all are. I think everybody here can agree, just because you, you commit to serving Christ doesn't make life automatically easier. And she has a rough history. She was a woman of the night. She's the second wife to a Muslim man who lives with his first wife and then goes to her house whenever he wants marital relations. And it's messy. But she loves Jesus. And as we're working through the New Testament together and as we're reading through new passages, she's breaking down crying because she's like, it's the first time she's recognizing what God wants for her life. So back to this girl now. She was 12 years old when all this started, when we started sharing with her mom. So she kind of grew up in this house of us going every week and sharing, sometimes multiple times a week, uh, sitting down and seeing her mom come to faith and ask these tough questions and going through the, the stories and then reading through the Gospel of Mark and then reading through Colossians and Galatians and just one book after another. A lot of times she'd be on her phone or she'd fall asleep on the couch, but she was there. And it was about a year ago... Not even a year. Um, well, you see the baby, so I'll mention this. She got married at 16. Not super uncommon. Got married at 16, got pregnant, got divorced. And she had actually asked us when, when the baby was almost due if, if we would baptize the baby when she was born. Uh, now, spoiler, I don't, I don't baptize babies. But we're in a place in the world where Catholicism and Orthodoxy is Christianity, where we are is less than half a percent evangelical believer, but around 6% Catholic and Orthodox. And so oftentimes when people think of Christianity in Jordan, they see that. And so in her mind, what she was asking or what she was thinking is that I want this child to grow up as a Christian because that's what the Catholic and Orthodox do. They baptize their infants. I mean, I'm simplifying all this, but they baptize infants so they grow up in the Christian community. Uh, That's what it signifies uh, in Jordan, at least. So that's what she wanted for her child. Now, at that point, she was still a Muslim. And she's asking us to make sure her child grows up as a Christian. 
Um, Because she saw her mother come to faith. And she saw the peace that we brought with us into her home. And it was about six months ago, uh, about three months after she asked us to do that, that, that she came to faith. We're actually sitting in her house one day, um, reading through Corinthians with her mom. And she just interrupts and was like, what do I need to do if I want to be a Christian? And so we, we stopped the first, we, we paused the first Corinthians studies and just started talking with her. And we sat for about two hours. Um, and it was shortly after that that, that she committed herself to, to Christ. Um, and so you see us baptizing her in the same bathtub that her mother was baptized in a year earlier. So praise God. Um, let's look at the next one. So another thing I like to point out is that just as active as God is in this, this world, the enemy is active also. He is trying to stop and hinder the work of the Lord on this earth. He's like a roaring lion trying to devour, right? Satan does not want us to succeed. Satan does not want God's kingdom to, to prevail on this earth. And one way we got to see this is through a woman named Marwa. And I'm going to tell this story quickly. But basically three years ago, we got to share with her. She asked us to stop. But she said, keep coming. And later we found out, she said that me and my Jordanian partner brought a peace into her home that she didn't understand. Now fast forward to about six months ago, three years later, we got her connected with another um, Christian woman that, that works with us. And she went into her home and Marwa just started bawling. They had this this epiphany moment. She started making statements of faith or crying. She's feeling the peace of God. She had a dream of Jesus. Um, and then her Catholic landlord asked her what she was doing. And she's all excited now because she's finally understanding who Jesus is. And she's like, oh yeah, we're reading the Bible. We're talking about Jesus. Um, I'm understanding that he's, he's um, God. And just all these awesome statements. Her landlord stops her mid-sentence and says, they are lying to you. Jesus is not God, and if I ever see Brent or Margo again, I'm going to call the police. And there's more messiness there, but um, just last week, this um, local partner of ours um, was back in her house continuing to share with her. Um, so it didn't deter her. She's, she's not come to faith yet, but she's close. Let's look at the next one. So this is Umra'id. She is one of the strongest women in her faith that I've ever met. Um, we, we baptized her about four, three years ago. Um, and we've just seen her grow exponentially in her faith. We introduced the prayer wheel to her. If you don't know what that is, it's like this little it, wheel that helps you get in the habit of praying. And it's 12 things, like pray five minutes for praise, five minutes for thanksgiving, five minutes for this, five minutes, 12 things. You do it, you pray for an hour. So we introduced that to her. She did it every day the first week, seven times. The next week, she went through it 10 times. And every week since then, she's gone through that prayer wheel and prayed for at least 15 hours a week on top of her normal prayers. Um, And she's just, she's just, I mean, a sponge soaking in all this stuff. Um, And she just, she loves Jesus. And let's look at the next one. Um, So I'll I'll go back to Umrah in a second. But um, this year, with these different people we've seen come to faith, we've been able to help plant a house church in one of their homes. Um, it actually kind of travels between a few homes. And my Jordanian partner is now leading the church while we're here. And so we have a Jordanian Muslim who became a Christian, and he's leading this church. And there's a Jordanian Christian, like born Christian. And there's all these Muslim women that have come to faith. And it's this cool little community um, that we get to be a part of. So let's look at the next one. Um, I briefly mentioned the trainings. And so on that that group A program at the church, uh, my team will do trainings for the Syrian community. And we've taught people how to make Dead Sea mud soaps. We've taught people how to crochet. We've done first aid trainings. And we're going to do more of these. But if you followed along anything that we do, you've probably seen me talk about the Dead Sea mud soaps. And Umra'id, the one that prays at least 15 hours a week, is the one that makes all of these. Um, we actually have some out here um, if you would like some. Um, so I'm going to go on to the next slide. And I'll be at this table afterwards if you have any questions or want to talk more or hear more about these stories. Um, but I want to end with a couple of prayer requests, um, and then I'll, I'll pray us out. So as you see, I could talk all day about this stuff. I just love what God is doing. I absolutely love seeing him work. 
Um, and we do have two main prayer requests that, that I ask you to pray for. One is just for our overarching ministry. Because what we see is that it's the people that are prepared for the gospel that are the ones that are receiving it. So while we visit and have shared with thousands of people, we've only had a handful come to faith. And it's that handful that were prepared for the gospel, where they, they had dreams and visions, where they had somebody share with them before. Whatever the reason is, they were prepared. So pray that the people we get to share with are prepared to hear the gospel before we go in their home. The second prayer request is a more immediate request, um, and it's money. We're trying to raise funds for a vehicle. Um, and we have little cards out there. They look like this. Oh, no. Um, you can pick one up. It has some information about it. Um, it's a little fundraising campaign. So if you want to give towards that, you can ask me more after. And also pick up one of our prayer cards. Stick it on your Bible, on your fridge. You can remember to pray for us. Um, so that's what I have this morning. Um, if you... If, if in, yeah, if you have any questions or, or anything, John's back here and you can talk to, to him also after service. Um, so, yeah, let me pray and then we'll keep going. So, Lord, we thank you for this morning. We just thank you for the time that you let me get up here and blabber a little bit about, about the work that you're doing in the Middle East. Um, I just pray that something I said um, was encouraging to this congregation, um, that something I was able to share um, is empowering and encouraging and, and uplifting to the people here that are able to see the work you're doing there, um, and that encourages them to, to look and, and understand better what you're doing here. So we thank you, Lord, for, for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your justice. And we thank you for loving us so perfectly. In your sins, then we pray. Amen. Amen.